Uh, we want to welcome you all to the ACIS Circuit of Influence talk. We're starting our third year. This is our third year of having a Circuit of Influence. History wise, it was the Circle of Concern that we started in 10, 20 years ago or so. And they expanded to the ACIS schools, public schools, um, incredible organization that did talk for uh, parents. And uh, unfortunately, the founders retired and then we went to take it over and to end it. And so our group of ACIS counselors and consultants were sitting around one day and thought, no, we should restart it. And we thought, let's talk about how we can influence our kids in a variety of topics and subjects. The other concept was, you know, panel every time, but plenty of opportunity to talk and share each other's wisdom, right? So as we're talking about today's executive function skills, you may be doing something with your kid at home that nobody else is doing. That might be a fabulous idea. So we encourage all of you as we go along to raise your hand, share an idea with other parents. So we learn best from other parents. And I learn great stuff here at St. Anne's with teachers all the time, and parents, and other great ideas that I've integrated in my own family. Uh, by way of introduction, I'm Craig Nickerberg. I'm the consultant here at St. Anne's. Uh, I'll be talking first, talking about the brain basis of executive function. Kathy Curry Riley, Riley is the uh, consultant at Grayland, Boer School uh, Counselor Grayland. And Mike Shields is a former uh, Boulder Country Day head and is now the middle school learning specialist here at St. Anne's. So we'll be your panelists. We'll just try to do about 20 minutes and then we'll get um, we can some more discussion at the end. We'll kind of go through some things. You should have a handout packet that hopefully is staple. There's kind of a little outline here if you want to take some notes and some of the PowerPoints in there. Not all the PowerPoints, no, there's just too much to copy, so we're trying to be really and not overwhelmed with uh, copying. Uh, so I'm going to start talking about the brain basis of executive function. The question would be, well, why are you talking about brain? Uh, for me, one of the reasons I love the brain is it helps me understand what's going on with the child. If I can understand what's going on with the child's brain, I'm more likely to think of a solution, uh, how to handle that, uh, and it helps me be more patient. So if I can understand things, my patience as a father, and as an educator, really trying to stop. So I had sixth graders this morning from 8 to 8.30. What do you think the average sixth grader is like at 8 o'clock in the morning? <laughs> right? And, and they did a brainstorm. Now you're always walking on the edge when you do a brainstorm in the middle schoolers because you see, one kid has an answer, 10, 20 kids are chit-chatting about it or about something else, and you're just like, hey, I'll see my book, slow down. You gotta slow down. Let's focus, okay? Uh, the other thing I like in terms of our talk, I'm going to give you some language. We'll be talking about language you can use with your kids. So it'd be pretty hard every day to say, I use Ms. Rollins as an IT person. If I, every day was like, now Jennifer, let's use your executive function skills right now. OK? That's a lot, right? Or I could say, uh, let's focus, focus, please. <coughs> or I could say, let's use your present. Let's use your present. Before you do that, before you press that button, is that really what you should do? Right? So it gives you common language to use for the kids. Uh, just by way of background, I do have an older son uh, who's up in college, a senior former senior grads, and my wife and I uh, just adopted a little eight-year-old girl. And I'm having a whole new experience with executive functioning skills. <laughs> how we need to use our president and stay focused. I'm going to stay, stay focused 20 times during our little 45 years old. Uh, and we can get distracted by a lot of things. Uh, and it has helped me to come up with some solutions along the way. Now, to get us started, I need four willing volunteers to come up for a quick little role play. Come on, jump up. <laughs> and, and four, okay. Amy, come on up. Mary, Jim, you look like this. No. <laughs> Alice, one more. All right, okay. And, and we're gonna, I'll, I'll make him the fourth guy. He's gonna be a guy named Phineas Gage. And the story of the role play we're gonna do is, how did scientists and, and medical people first start thinking about what parts of our brain do what? And particularly this part right here, the part for executive function. So they were a railroad crew back in the 1870s in Vermont. And they're out there working all day. Now if you think about the average railroad worker, what would you think they're like? Do you think they had high degrees of education? Throughout the country, right? <coughs> they had the best behavior, personal behavior. Probably not. They're big, rough, tough guys. Probably not the most folks gents, probably after work, what do you think they like to do? Probably drink, probably gamble a lot, maybe some fist fights, right? Just rough and tough kind of guys, okay? So now Amy's going to be the first one on the group. Step up, please. 
And her job on the river, so when they had to be blasted, they would have these crews. And her job was to take the, this is going to be our drill, our little swizzle stick drill. And she would come along to the hole, to where they needed a hole, and she would drill a hole. Okay, so she's going to bend down and drill a hole. Okay, very nice. She'd step <laughs> off. Then uh, Mary would come along, and Mary had either gunpowder or dynamite sticks at the, the, the time. And I don't know what they had in that actual incident, but some form of explosive. And we'll just say it's gunpowder, and she poured it on her. Okay? Be careful, that's dangerous. Okay? She'd step up. <coughs> now, at this point, and she put a wick in it too, she'd have the wick. At this point, if we lit it, where's the energy going to go? Straight back out of the hole, right? So you got you want the energy to go down to the rock. So the next person on our crew, Alice, would come along with a bucket full of sand. She'd pour the sand in the hole, okay? If we lit it right now, which way the energy is going to go? It's still going to go up. We're going to have a giant sandstorm. So what do you need to do? you got to pack it down so tight, tamp it down, it makes a plug. And the plug is stronger than the rock, and the blast goes down. So our final person was our crew director. In this case, Jim's I.E. Phineas Gage is the guy's name. Now, before I have him do his stick, I'll tell you that in the medical journals, when they talk about Phineas Gage, they said he was a refined gentleman. He was educated. He didn't use inappropriate language. He did not lose control of his temper. He was organized, punctual, had good attention skills. Is this the guy you want leaving your crew? Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Now, he also had the most dangerous job. He had the tamping cheese stick, which is actually about a three foot long steel pole. And he would put it in the hole, and he'd take the sledgehammer, and I really want you to get into it, and wait. Okay? Now he would hit it, okay? Pack that thing tight, they would scurry off, and they would explode it, everything's good. Okay? They would do this day after day after day, so time. All right, now we come back. We're going to do what happened one mysterious day. So come back, keep, keep your props, keep your explosives. Okay, so one day, they're coming along, and he drills the hole. Okay, excellent, she moves off, and it comes along, pours the explosives in. And then Alice, maybe it was out drinking last night, playing cards too late. <laughs> She's kind of not really focused. And she steps right past the hole and forgets to put the sand in. Now Phineas comes along, does not know there's no sand in the portal from the hole. Puts that puppy down. I really want you to, when you do it, because I'm going to show you what actually happened to the guy. Hits it, okay? Now really come over the top of your head. Bam! What happens? It explodes. That three foot pole shoots out of the hole, hits him in the cheek, comes up the top of his head. I'm not going to make it like that. The fourth grade is a huge <laughs> fourth grade. I have a, a curriculum here at St. Anne's, basement of the brain. Fourth grade, this is almost the whole year we do this. He'd be laying down. Okay? The other three workers go, whoa. <laughs> whoa. Oh. <Yeah. laughs> now, they think he's dead. They walk over there. And Phineas is laying there, awake. His eyes are open. He's not unconscious. And they go, whoa. <laughs> and together they decide we should get a plan. Now, they didn't have much medical help. They put him in the buckboard. They took him to the closest town, put him in the boarding home. They cleaned it, put some band-aids over it, left him in bed. Okay? Three months, that is gone. Skull blew it out. Brain matter everywhere. Okay? It, it's gone. It went straight up there. And I'll show you a picture of the actual skull in the family. Um, three months later, he gets out of bed. Physically, he's just fine. And he gets out of bed. Now he's fine physically, he's still a bright guy, but they notice some big changes in him. All of a sudden, he can't pay attention. He gets distracted. He shows up late all the time. He doesn't have his equipment. He starts getting angry at the other guys, starts fighting with other people, starts using inappropriate language, starts taking to drink, starts gambling, obsessing every night, right? Becomes a complete caveman. Give a cave in the book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so after several months, the head of the railroad crew comes by and says, Phineas, <coughs> he was such a caveman that he couldn't even work at the railroad. Okay? Totally out of control. Now Phineas is still a great guy. The end of the story is Phineas goes to Harvard Medical School and he says to the medical school doctors, Would you like my brain when I die to study it? 
because it was a medical miracle at this point. And they're like, yeah, we'd love it. Here's some money. What's he do with money? Gambles and drinks it all away. So then he goes to Yale Medical School. He says, to Yale guys, would you like my brain when I die? And he said, sure, here's some money. What's he do with it? Drinks and gambles away. Then he goes to Princeton, sells his brain to Princeton. And this time he drank himself to death. Uh, he died of acute alcohol poisoning. He was just out of control. Was he still smart? Yes. But did he have any self control? We could say he totally lacked executive functioning skills. They were gone. Okay? Still smart, and that's the key thing with kids. This is not about how smart you are. It's about how well you can manage your brain. And we'll talk about those skills in a second. Um, at Harvard, did his brain. Uh, they still have it. And up until about 20 years ago, every year they would take it to this little town in Vermont on the anniversary. They take his brain and the skull and have a little party. And apparently, some medical student dropped the skull. And uh, so they don't, it doesn't leave the medical school. So when you hear kids are going to Harvard Medical School, they can see Phineas and Brain. The rest of us have to look at pictures. So let's give them a round of applause. Uh, uh, and I'll show you this picture quick. I didn't have time to get my PowerPoint. That's the actual camping iron, and that's a skull. That's what shot through his head. Okay. Yeah, so that's the actual thing that took out his front row. Now I'll turn on my PowerPoint. I'll show you the path a little bit. If I do this right, I'm not doing it right. Bottom. One. Okay. There's the, uh, the picture of Phineas. That's the path of the pole. You can see in the 3D computer image graphic of where that pole went. took out his front part of his brain, the frontal lobe or the prefrontal cortex. Okay. What I like to call with kids, this is your president. Okay? So the fancy the, the short, easy term for kids is that's your president. I did have a kindergartner once years ago who went home and said to his mother, Mom said, What you talking about today, honey? And he thought and the little boy said, Mom, President Clinton's in my brain. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, and it was right after the Monica thing. So it's like, well, that would be an example of not having a president. Okay? Not using a president. But, so I always have to make sure the kids understand that Mark Obama's not in their head. Just, this is the president of their brain. It helps with things like attention. Now, it's not just the ability to attend, okay? It's also the ability well, so, so, to avoid distractions, but also then to switch attention when you need to. Okay? So think about how many times in your day you're focused on one thing and then you've got to do something else, right? You're constantly switching your attention to other things, okay? So it's the ability to focus and also switch your attention. And avoid distractibility. Things like organization, having what you need. Okay? Every now and then I love to do a desk check with the fourth graders and locker checks with the sixth graders. Okay? You can always tell which kids have good executive functioning skills because they're perfect. Right? And then you get to the desk or the locker, you're like, whoa, man, that's worse than my daughter's room. <laughs> that's really messy. Right? Uh, impulse and emotional control, it's the stuff. It's the part of your brain that says stop when you want to do something. So if the, you got a second grade boy and the football goes on the roof, what's the second boy, or some second grade boys want to do? Want? Go get it. I had one of our classmates, <coughs> one of my son's classmates years ago, who uh, my son came running into the house at his birthday party saying, Dad, Freddy's on the roof. <laughs> I'm like, what? And sure enough, Freddy had taken the garbage can, stepped him up, got on the cardboard, and was on the roof getting the football. I'm like, Freddy, please stop. Right? We really shouldn't be doing it. When the kickball goes across the street, when Johnny's supposed to run to get the kickball, when he gets to the street, we're supposed to stop. Look both ways. Okay? Uh, it's also when you're mad. Okay? If I get mad, I'm so frustrated. King Supers didn't have the coffee earlier this morning. I was trying to get over here. I'm driving down Yale to come back. And the car in front of me is going super slow. Okay? Now, what emotion am I feeling right now? Pretty stressed. Right? What's the temptation? Honk, honk, right? Maybe zip around and no passing. Okay? I have to stop that emotion. And I have to think about what are the potential consequences of this? Right? What could happen? If I get pulled over, am I going to be even later than I already am? Yeah, and probably a ticket. Right? I don't want to start a fight with this other person. Because that's the ability to stop your emotions. There's another part of the brain that actually thinks about your feelings. It's right below your frontal lobe. It's on the right side of the brain. Uh, it's your thinking feeling brain. Once you stop the emotions, you can think about, well, how would that driver feel if I want? 
maybe that driver's going slow for a reason. Maybe it's an elderly person. They're having a hard time driving, right? They could allows me to think about my feelings and kind of brainstorm how I should handle it. But if you don't stop the emotions, you can't brainstorm. Um, movement control. Movement control center of the brain is right in the middle of the front lobe. How many of you are fidgeters, natural fidgeters? That I always have a pen or paper clip. I have to move. Okay. Uh, how many of your kids are pretty motorically active? They're, they're moving around. Okay. If you go to any kindergarten classroom, what are most of the boys doing? Spinning around. Okay. Now the development of this part of your brain, girls are about a year and a half to two years out of this. So in any kindergarten classroom. Most of those girls are sitting there. They look so pretty. They have their little dresses on their hair that looks nice. And it could be after lunch and they still look beautiful. Right? And they sit crisscross applesauce spoons in the bowl. And when they want to talk, what do they do? They raise their hand. Right? And they say, Mr. Newtonberg. And it's just delightful. What do most of the boys do? First, where do they sit? Where do they want to sit? In the back, right? Or by the blocks or something. And they're spinning around and they're touching their friend. They got lunch all over them and they're sticking out. And when they want to talk, they just blurt it out. Sometimes it's on the topic. And sometimes it's not even close. <laughs> and there's always some boy that like wants to touch my shoes or something. I'm like, don't touch my shoes, man. Just sit still. Uh, so moving control. Time management. This one, uh, apparently not a little girl girl. This one is really struck me. It's probably one of the most critical fundamental functions which is how long will this take me to do, okay? And how much time do I have? So it's not just reading a clock. It's the ability to sort of estimate in your head how long something would take and how much time you have. So on, when my son was about four, I can remember, we'd be driving in the mountains and he'd say, Dad, how long before we get there? And I'd stop and I'd think and I'd say, that's about, about two of your veggie tail films, okay? And he would think, and he'd go, okay. He could figure out, so how long is the average preschool bed sales? About 20 minutes, right? He knew about how long 20 minutes was, and he could figure out two of them, and that would tell him how long before we got there, okay? Now, on the micro level, kickball goes across the street. Hopefully the kid stops. Now he looks both ways, sees a car coming, okay? His brain has to calculate, how long for me to get across the road? How long before that car gets to the middle of the road, okay? If you're off by a second, could that be deadly? Yes, okay, so teen drivers, we'll talk to teen brain in a second. Teen drivers, the hardest move for a teen driver is a left turn. You have to calculate how fast is that car coming at me, right? How much time do I get across this road? If I'm driving a Prius, can I really gun it across the road? You know, it stalls a little bit. It's got that electric thing, you know, a little jerk, right? That's the hardest move for a teenage driver, okay? Kids with poor executive functioning skill have four times the accident rates of other kids. The teenagers when they're driving. They just can't estimate the time. Okay? Your homework assignments are like one kid comes on me, say, how much homework do you have? And how long will it take? And they say, Well, I think my reading will take me 20 minutes, and I think that project I'm working on, I'm gonna put 15 minutes into that, and I think I better leave about 25 for that math, because that's kind of a tricky assignment for me. I've got that hard time that concept. That's probably a girl. <laughs> you say to your son, how much homework do you got? How long is it gonna take you? What's he say? Oh, uh, I don't know, like 10 minutes. I think 10 minutes, right? Can I play video games for a while? Okay, are you sure it's only 10 minutes? Oh, yeah, Mom, it's only 10 minutes, okay? Then finally we get him off the video machine, and it's 9 o'clock, and he's got an hour and a half. Right? <laughs> Just can't estimate the time. Uh, working memory is really the whole things in your head as assignments are given. Or given. So the teacher says, open your, uh, get your math books out, turn it to page 12, do number 16, okay? You've got to stop what you're doing, put away your spelling book, find the math book, get your pencil, get your paper, right? What page did I say? What page? 12. 12. Problem number 16. I said 16, didn't I? Yeah, okay. That's your working memory. Can you hold those things in your head while you're getting ready to do them, okay? At home, you say, hey, we're leaving in five minutes. Get your shoes on, get your socks, don't forget your permission slip, meet me at the door. Okay? Some kids, they hold all three of those things in their mind. They know five minutes isn't much time, you better hurry. They step upstairs, get their shoes and socks on, <coughs> permission slip, they come down, they're standing there a minute. Early. Other kids start up the stairs, they find a napkin. Oh, I just learned that new origami. 
I think I'll make a little origami figurine. Okay? Five minutes go by, you're like, where are you, honey? He's like, oh, I'm coming. And they come out, no socks on, maybe one shoe in a hand, no permission slip, right? And how are you feeling? Really frustrated. You're like, what is going on? I told you five minutes, right? They just, don't, they can't do the time, and they forget things. It's the etch-a-sketch memory. And then uh, gating is the ability to filter out sounds or vision things, other senses, okay? So right now there's this blower going on, I think I kind of hear. So if you're hearing the blower, your, your frontal lobe is saying, listen to the speaker, ignore the blower, okay? Uh, if someone walks by here, one of the maintenance guys comes by or comes into the kitchen, you're, you're going to see that out of the corner of your brain, right? Your frontal lobe is supposed to say, just avoid that distraction. Don't look at that, okay? Uh, for, the, for the sound things, more and more now we're allowing children to use the headphones, the noise canceling headphones, okay? So for some kids in a classroom, the noise of the other children, they cannot stay focused. It's really hard for them. So they, they have a hard time with gating. And that's what the, the, the frontal lobe does. It decides what sound or sense should I pay attention to, what should I filter out to. Does that make sense? Uh, same thing would be, uh, you know, the, when I was a boy, the tags in the back of your shirt. I don't know if you have any of you guys out there, but, you know, my mom had to cut them all off. Because all day long, I feel the tag back there, and drive me nuts, right? My frontal lobe wasn't mature enough to, to block that sense out, okay? So it's going to block out other senses. That's it. Now, scale of executive functioning, if we gave a test, average female is about 80th percentile. Uh, both in elementary school and later in adulthood, okay? Uh, average guy is about 50 percentiles. Which, uh, genetic reasons for that, we don't have time for that, don't get to Kathy. Uh, but the average boy is about 50, the average girl is about 80th percentile. Uh, when they're three and four, they don't have much of a president. You're pretty much the president when they're three. So the safe way when they want the cookie and you say, no, I'm excited to fit. I saw mom dragging her little child out of King Supers last night. He was bloody fit, right? Doesn't have much of a president. <laughs> little girls start to have one first. You're hoping by first, second grade, you have that basic president for all the children. They can sit still longer, they can pay attention, they can do seat time, remember, 20 minutes of, of, of seat work, you know. Yesterday morning I walked in the first grade, all the children were reading, just perfect. Then I walked in the room, I said, it's so peaceful. You know, you're doing, you're using your presidents. Everybody's reading. It's just so delightful, right? So uh, then, as the teenagers hit, there's some changes happening in the brain. We don't have enough time to go on all of them. But it doesn't work as well. The frontal lobe is rapidly growing. It's growing new branches just tremendously. You're jumping by. Uh, most of your brain cell development as puberty starts, you, you have about 90 billion brain cells when you're in fourth grade, third, fourth grade. By adulthood, late 20s, you'll have 100 billion. The extra 10 billion is mostly in the frontal lobe. That's a really critical area of brain development. There's a lot of other things happening. But by the age of 26 for girls, 28 for boys, you're cooked. You're, you're president is finally that fine working machine. It goes a lot faster as well. Your little second grader brain, uh, brain speed's about two miles an hour. Uh, by 26 or 28, your brain goes about 200 miles an hour. Okay, it's a lot faster. So think about how much you process, how much you hold in your head, how fast you do things. That's an adult brain. It continues to pick up speed till you're about 35, and then guess what? It starts to slow down. And the working memory goes really, I can tell you, it really goes fast. The working memory goes fast, okay? Uh, I just read a research that I said, you know, part of it is your brain gets full. It just, it doesn't do a lot of new memories and stuff because it's so full of things that it doesn't have a lot of extra room. Uh, another simple way to understand all, and you got to think about your child. Research study on can you resist the marshmallow back in the 60s, they gave little preschoolers they give Alistair a marshmallow and they'd say, now you can have the marshmallow right now, or if you can wait 10 minutes when I come back, I'll give you four more, and you can have five. Alice here might decide to wait. And she waits, and about a third of the subjects, like 33% of the kids just wait, they got four more. Andrew, is that what you say? Okay. She's thinking, um, well, I'll try and wait. And she's looking at the marshmallow, they film these kids. She's touching the marshmallow. She's licking the marshmallow. She's looking back. Wall Street brokers are taking chunks off and then reshaping it to lick the marshmallow. Right. And on average, after seven minutes, guess what she does? She eats it. Okay. Now, stuff in here. As I'm explaining about the marshmallow, she grabs it out of my hand and just eats it. Okay. She can't wait at all. 
They follow those kids years later in their 20s. They're still studying now. They're about my age. Uh, they're following them through, through adulthood. The kids who ate it right away, how do you think their lives have turned out? Pretty difficult. They've had very difficult like lower levels of education, lower uh, levels of happiness in family, financially struggling. They really had a tough life. Well, higher levels of incarceration. The people in the middle, doing pretty well, average. The Alice's of the world, the kids who could wait, superior in every category. Now that they're in their 50s, they're studying health outcomes. The eaters, the marshmallow eaters, have higher rates of obesity, diabetes, heart, heart risk problems, all sorts of health issues, versus the Alice's of the world have much better health outcomes. Okay. So you have to kind of think about, well, where's your child? Where are they on that scale? And then you have to apply the strategies that you might be going to talk about accordingly. One general rule of thumb is the less, the further you are down here, the less internal control you have, you need more external control. You need more structure. You have to have structure in life. Your kids need more structure if they're further down. During adolescence, they all slide down. And then around the end of eighth grade, girls really seem to show some maturity. Uh, their, their brains are starting to come along. They start to move back up the scale. Uh, for you boys, they just have the eight middle school boys. It's not until about the end of sophomore year. So I know Michelle is like, oh my God, I thought it was going to be over this year. I got a couple years to go. It, they, they really don't really mature and make that jump to about the end of sophomore year when they start to show some insight and they start wearing cologne and combing their hair, probably because of a girl. Girls do wonderful things in helping men mature and learn how to themselves better. And for the teen guy, there's a great line from the. Uh, Oh, that's the Dr. Seuss movie that was just out about the environment where they cut down all the trees. Thorax, and the, the, the Lunsler says, if a boy, if a guy does something stupid once, it's because he's a guy. That's where we're on the scale, right? We're 50 percent we're not more impulsive. If a guy does something stupid twice, it's probably because of uh, a girl. Right? That's a line out of the movie. That's great. That's true. Uh, okay. Last couple of slides. Here's the brain bone of the frontal lobe. They can say five years is a good start, but if it's working better. Okay, that's the norm, that's the average kid, and their brain's uh, getting darker, bluer, showing more activity in the frontal lobe. Uh, if you look at kids with, so if you're on the far end of the spectrum, the diagnosis for that would be executive function difficulties or ADHD. Uh, ADHD has a few extra components for some of the kids, but it's basically if they have a poor working president. For kids on the, in the ADHD range, when you look at their brain scans, they're about two or three years behind. They do show progress, but they're always a couple years behind their peers, right? So these are the kids that are struggling with sitting still, paying attention, being organized, managing time, and working out. Does that make sense? Um, I'm going to talk real quick. The big, big file, I'm going to turn over them. I was talking to first graders yesterday. We started our safety curriculum. Number one is wear a helmet, protect your head. And I told the little kids, if you're playing soccer, don't head the ball. No one of you should be head the ball. That really causes serious brain damage. We talked about concussion and boss walk well for the football game uh, the other day. Coaches thought he was fine, they sent him back in. Guess what? He had a concussion. Really stupid. They should have taken kept him out. Protect the head. Water. Your kids need a lot of water during the day. They need to stay hydrated. Nutrition. I uh, was gonna just bring the coffee cakes this morning and I thought, well if I have nutrition on this slide, I really need to provide something else. <laughs> so I thought I have a fruit basket. That's good. And then I was as I was leaving I thought. Cheese, we need cheese sticks. Cheese has a lot of protein, okay? Best thing you can give your kid in the morning and for snacks, whole grain foods, uh, not, not the, you know, the simple grains, complex carbs, and protein. Protein's one of the best things for your frontal lobe. It burns the longest, it, it, it'll last four hours, okay? Your, your Krispy Kreme donut's gonna last about how long? 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and your brain's cooked through it. So, those are your best things for feeding. Uh, sleep, your kids need 10 hours a night, okay? Nine, 10 hours, they get a little bit older, you can trim it down some, but not much. The most important thing with sleep is consistent bedtime. The one thing that will knock your kid's president out for a loop is staying up late one night, right? Bedtime the next night, or not the next night. Consistent bedtime is the most important thing for sleep. And good frontal lobe function. When your kid has an overnight to come home, I can remember my mom saying, someone didn't get enough sleep last night. And I'd be like, yes, I did! <laughs> right? Uh, but back to my response, I'll tell you what, we were up too late, right? So when you're tired, the frontal lobe switches off, okay? And your emotions come pouring out of you at that point. Uh, and exercise, lots of exercise. 
uh, and on the slide we've got the reasons for that. But I tell you, one of my experiences here years ago, came into the fourth grade classroom, my son was in the class that year, and our dear assistant, Miss Holberton, Molly Holberton, who's a friend of Amy's, whose daughter is in our daughter's playgroup. So I ran into Molly at the playgroup over here at, what's that church, University? University of Park United Medicine, at the drama club together. Ran into Molly, it was so good to see her, and I remember in fourth grade she was the assistant, and I was coming in to teach the class, and all the kids were leaving. I'm like, Miss Holberton, did you forget I, I class? And she said, oh no, they're just not paying attention very well. I told them all to go run a lap. <laughs> Is that good thinking? Yeah, yes. right? She knew that these kids couldn't pay attention. They needed to go out and run. They needed to get oxygen to their brain for their little presidents to work better, right? And it worked fabulous. So they need lots of movement. And I'm done. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm gonna turn over to Kathy. She's gonna talk about strategies for rule shortage. Two last things while she's getting ready. I've got a little uh, video series, video series on about your kid's social brain, and part of it's what we just talked about, and how you can do emotions and social processing. It's on my website. And my buddy Kyle Feingold is here for results learning. He's got a new program, it's an after school program for executive functioning skills, four days a week. So I brought some of his brochures. This is Kyle Ray, he's a great man, Kyle. So, and he's doing a test project at St. Mary's. Right now, it's the same as they have a, a group of students have to come after school working on the executive function stuff. Okay. Microphone? Um, sure. Okay. Uh, well, thanks so much for having me. Um, and I'm going to piggyback a little bit on what Mike said. Um, two things. Um, just, just to. Um, to kind of piggyback on some of the things that Ms. Spike said. So we, he was talking about our brain. And one thing I think is really helpful to remember is that our brain develops from the back to the front. And so what we know are those, those executive functioning skills um, really take place in the front of the brain. And so our brain is a fully formed until we're, they know now, around 25. Um, so if you think about that, and, and Craig was giving that example of the, the three-year-old melting down at Target. And then as that child gets older, they, they get the ability to control themselves because their brain is growing. Um, and so, so here's um, something I think to think about in terms of executive functioning, is that um, sometimes people will have executive <coughs> functioning uh, concerns or weaknesses. And oftentimes, you'll think about it as a parent, um, oh gosh, back in kindergarten, he just couldn't organize himself, but I didn't think it was a big deal, he was just in kindergarten. Um, and then, as they're um, asked to do more tasks developmentally, you recognize, oh gosh, this is a bigger problem than I thought. Um, but here's the thing, so some of it is a nature thing, the way our brain is wired, but some of it is nurture. Um, so it's kind of looking at the things that you can do in your home to flex that executive function muscle, if you will. What can you put in place? Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll get to that um, as, as we go along so that your kids can be set up to be successful with these skills that we know we will need to be successful. Um, so oftentimes we use that metaphor of um, it's your executive functioning, it's the president, it's the symphony conductor, it's the air traffic controller, you know, all these um, different metaphors for it's in control of helping you organize and plan how to um, execute your day, how to use that past memory um, to um, then make implications toward how things will help you in the future. Um, so um, I have, I did um, make some copies of my hand, <laughs> but they're so small. <laughs> but I did, the, I put all the slides together because <laughs> I don't have to use your reading glasses, but I can hand them them out afterward. This is just kind of a list and of some of the things. Have, everybody got, they got a packet. We had more than was expected, but you should have it in the pack. Oh nice well, slides. I okay. And we've got more after. Uh, okay. Um, and so these are just some of the things. Um, that you do throughout your daily life where you are engaging your executive functioning skills. 
Um, but just moving on, um, Craig really hit on some of the biggies that we think about in terms of executive functions. Um, the one thing that I wanted to talk about that he didn't mention is shift. And that when I talk about shift or flexibility, um, I talk. I, sometimes kids will have a hard time with transitions, um, and oftentimes in school we ask them to transition a lot, um, and they can be small transitions from one class to gym, and oh my gosh, um, different teachers have different expectations, and I have to figure out what the expectations of the different teachers are. Um, it can be transitioning from summer back to school and what that looks like and, and sometimes that can be really anxiety producing for kids. So I kind of think of shift as transitioning and flexibility, that brain flexibility. Um, emotional control, I do have to tell you, he was talking a little bit about emotional control. And Sesame Street is doing this fabulous thing this year where Cookie Monster is getting self-control. <laughs> um, and if, if you guys have a minute, you need to get on YouTube and search Cookie Monster self-control. And they have this video of Cookie Monster. I, I, if we have time, I'll show it to you. It, it just is hysterical. And Cookie Monster in his little song and dance says, I need executive functioning. And, and all of it is so, so funny. Um, but we're teaching kids more and more about the importance importance of self-control. There are schools out there that show um, kids the marshmallow test um, and then have shirts that say, don't eat the marshmallow. <laughs> but just recognizing the importance of being able to delay gratification, which is how important that is. But Google that, that cookie monster, especially if your kids are young. Um, and then um, the other thing I just wanted to hit on from this list before we go on to specific strategies is initiation. Um, so sometimes um, you feel like, gosh, I know my kid is smart and he can pull it off, but he's sitting in class and they give him a writing prompt uh -huh. and the teacher says he just sits there with you know a big question mark on his face and he can't get down to doing it. Or you see this at home, he knows what his homework is, but he goes to the bathroom five times and then he checks this and that. It's just actually sitting down and settling in and getting the work started sometimes can be really, really difficult. I know I struggle with this sometimes. <laughs> um, and then um, organizing material. That's another thing I just wanted to kind of highlight too. Um, oftentimes, as parents, you know, we'll work really, really hard with the child to help them on an assignment, and then, lo and behold, you find out that the kiddo didn't turn it in, or somewhere in between home and the teacher's desk, it got lost. So it's figuring out how to organize, and or another example, a child gets home and doesn't have the materials they need to complete the assignment for that night. It's just, or, and, and I, I mean, looking at kids' desks and lockers, great examples. I mean, you can tell pretty quickly if this is a strength or not. Um, and then the last one um, that I just wanted to bring up is self-monitoring. So sometimes um, kids can struggle with, with self-monitoring, so they have a hard time kind of taking stock, having that internal voice that says, okay, in this situation, um, I think I need to work on this, and um, I did pretty well on this. Um, so it's the child that, that feels like, I aced that test, and then they get the test back, and they found it, right? So it's kind of helping people self-monitor. Um, so then, um, moving on, it, it, I think sometimes you get the sense, maybe something's going on with my child, what is it? We wonder, should we be concerned? Um, I actually, in your packet, um, there's a great um, list of what's, what are some executive function tasks um, that, that children should be able to accomplish at certain developmental ages. And I think that that's a really good reference to look at um, in every kind of executive functioning book that you um, that that they have out on the market, they have essentially this very developmental um, task list. So I think it's just something good to kind of review and 
see, gosh, is this more of a problem for my child than I thought? Um, so something to, to review. Um, so if you kind of think, okay, I, I think that there's something going on here, or a teacher has um, contacted you saying, hey, I'm noticing that this is really a, a child for Susie, Sarah, what have you. Um, I'll just kind of walk through some of the things to think about. Um, the first is thinking about how, how can we help. So oftentimes it's clearly defining the concerns and deciding where to start. Because sometimes you think, oh gosh, something's not right, but I'm not really, really sure. And so it's really being a detective and watching what is going on with your child. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry, that was okay. Oh, okay. Um, and sometimes that means um, saying that, scheduling a talk with a teacher um, or other people that observe their child and say, hey, are you seeing this play out? Um, and then figuring out how you can be the architect to craft a plan for your child. Um, and I like really tangible plans, so I'm going to give you some examples. Um, because I, I feel like we talk about these, these things a lot, and oftentimes kids that struggle with executive functioning skills need that tangible, <coughs> you know, in hand, this is what we're working on, this is how we're measuring it, mom and dad and the teacher are gonna sit down again on Thursday to see how I've done. Um, so, so I'll give you a bunch of examples. Um, I also think it's really important to tailor the intervention to fit the child. Right? So we know that um, we really have to get crafty um, and creative. And I think the more creative we can be and the more um, we can involve the child in the intervention, the more successful <coughs> we're going to be. Um, my biggie is that habits and routine <coughs> create independence. Um, and this is really, really important for kids. This is how you guys can nurture that executive functioning. So every morning, these are the specific things we do before we go to school. So if kids can learn those, those skills, um, they have kind of a template, if you will, for what the morning routine looks like. And then those executive functioning skills aren't, ta um, ta aren't as taxed, if, you, if that makes sense. Um, I love, I, I give an example, we have a librarian at Grayland who is just fabulous. Um, and she has the kids sing this little song um, when they come in. Um, and she, uh, it's like this little rhyme. Um, Eyes are watching, ears are listening, um, voices off, bodies calm. This is how we listen, story time. And it's just this really, really cute little nursery rhyme, but it's a routine that they have, and it's that prompt of this is what a learning body looks like. And they sing the song, and then they talk about it. But just little routines like that, incorporating them into your life, I think, can really, really help. And I'm, I'm, I'm a biggie. This is something I just really feel strong about. Um, and then another thing um, is using behavior modification to raise the stakes and spotlight the goals. Um, so um, behavior modification, when I often think about explain it as like star charts, goal charts, sticker charts, things like that, because when you put together a sticker chart, what you have to do is clearly define what you want to see in your child. And so that they have a really good picture of how they're going to earn that sticker. Um, and they also recognize that if they do it well, they get a positive response from it. Um, and that kind of raises the stakes for kiddos. Sometimes they need that little extra motivation. Um, and then whether you incentivize that as a parent or not is kind of up to you. Um, and then um, also helping children with their self-talk, that, that metacognition, so that they can think about their thinking. And I'll give some examples of this as, as we go forward. Because sometimes kids will get so overwhelmed um, that then they'll just say, oh, forget it. I'm, I'm just bagging this. So it's then working with a child. When I feel that feeling, you know, these are things I can say to myself to calm myself down and use that learning brain of mine to re-engage. Um, and I do some kind of, I'll show you, I get kind of crafty with this one. So um, what, I, what I did is, is pick out a couple specific um, executive functioning skills um, and um, 
list specific things that you can do um, for them. So the first is um, controlling impulses, which is really, really tough. Um, sometimes it is to help a child stop and think, you know, before they talk, before they grab, what have you. Um, so sometimes I'll talk to a kiddo about it and we'll say, hey, this is getting, up, getting in our way. We need to figure out how to help you stop and think. And so we'll create um, visual signs, verbal signs, or hey, when I touch you on the shoulder, that means I, I notice that you need to stop and think. You know, I have lots of um, stop signs <laughs> or around the classroom, on stage desks, what, what have you, to kind of encourage them to stop and think. Um, I also think it's good for us to think, OK, if I have a really impulsive kiddo, and we're walking into, say, Thanksgiving, Okay, and I know that um, cousin Sarah has an eye patch. Um, she's wearing an eye patch. Um, let's talk about, let's prep kids as much as possible for what is expected and, and what would be a polite way to ask her about the eye patch or what have you. But if, if, if you're recognizing, okay, my child is really impulsive and may um, do something that's unsafe in this situation, before we go in in a really calm manner, I'm going to go over the guidelines of the behavior that I want to see. Um, so, and then the last thing, I think sometimes when kids are really impulsive, um, we may see them making choices that are unsafe. Um, and oftentimes when they're making a, a, a choice that's unsafe, like the first thing that we have to do is make, grab them and make sure that they are safe. <laughs> um, and then afterward, kind of think about the planning what we can do to help there. Um, but let's see, um, this is just an example of um, a chart. I will tell you, um, some <coughs> teachers that really like run the other way when they see me coming because I'm like, okay, let's put in a chart. Let's put in a, <laughs> um, but this is an example of a, of, of a kiddo who, was having, who may be having a hard time stopping and thinking before they act or speak. And so um, this, um, travels with him throughout the day, and if you see the little stop sign, it says, I stop, think, observe, and I think it's participate. Um, and then he gets to, he or she would get to circle it if he felt like he did a good job from 8 to 11.15. Um, and he talks to the teacher about it to see if, if she or he thinks that the, the child can circle it. Um, and then they're just self-reflecting on, okay, was I able to stop and think and make good choices throughout my day? So that's just an example. Um, now, um, <coughs> helping kids shift gears. Um, I do think when kids have a hard time with transitioning and change, it may feel counterintuitive because we want to help them be flexible, but having routine and consistency is really, really important. Um, but then if we know that a routine is changing, again, prepping them for that change. So every day we have morning meeting and then we do a certain activity, or every Saturday this is our normal routine, but it's changing. So it's sitting down when you're calm and saying, hey, you know, this Saturday we have a really great opportunity and our routine is going to look different. And, and talk to them about how that routine will change. I think sometimes when we realize that kids um, struggle with transitions and may become anxious about a transition, sometimes as parents we waver and say, oh, should we talk about it, should we not? Um, because maybe if we don't talk about it, they won't think about it, um, and then we'll just spring them on them last minute. <laughs> and sometimes that, that actually creates more of a problem, so it's talking about the changes that we know are going to happen um, beforehand. Um, let's see. Uh, let's give a little example. I'm a big fan of using social stories, especially with little kids. Um, and so sometimes what we'll do is we'll create a story about a change that is about to occur. And we include the child in the story. Um, and so this is just an example of a story um, that then sometimes we'll review with the child before the big change is going to occur. So sometimes if kids are anticipating, say, you're moving from one house to the next. That's a big transition for, for kids, for some kids. Um, and so it's thinking, okay, let's make a story. And I like to add pictures if I can. 
as well about you know our family's moving there are some great things that are going to happen and then there's some sad things um, <coughs> and adding pictures and making it really familiar so it's just a really non-threatening way to go over some of the things a child may feel um, yeah there's an ipad app for that actually yeah so creator pro yeah they're um you know, pictures and you can record your voice mm -hmm. and can do it on their own it's really good yeah, there are, there are a couple different apps. Um, and social stories were originally created for kids that were on the autism spectrum. Um, but I'm using them more and more, especially with little kids. And there are a lot of fabulous apps. Um, and, and even if you get on Pinterest and um, search social story, you can even put in a specific thing that your child is struggling with. And there are tons of different ideas that then you can kind of tailor and make your own. But I, I lo it's a great intervention. And it seems so simple, um, but it really resonates with kids because it feels personal. And the parents or the teachers, when they're reading it, it really feels non-threatening. Um, so sometimes we'll get frustrated because our kid won't transition, blah, blah, blah. But if we can, if we can recognize or we, if we can realize this is going to be hard for the child, have the social story ready, have the conversation, they can be prepared for it. Okay. Um, helping, then the, the next thing I want to just go over is helping children get started on homework and other tasks. Um, actually, I should back up. Whenever you're sort of thinking about how to structure helping your child with an intervention, I always think of two things. I think of how um, we can help the child with the immediate concern. Um, and help them feel some success, right? And then how we can help them eventually become more independent. Um, so sometimes that requires um, a, a prosthetic environment at first, if you, if you will. Um, so where you are sitting down and helping your child engage or giving them that first um, prompt to get going, right? But then we're thinking about how to pull back um, once they're feeling more successful so that they can do it on their own. Um, so in terms of getting, um, getting kids started, I'm a huge fan of technology too, setting timers. And there are a lot of fabulous um, timer apps. Um, and a lot of them are free or even just using, if you have an iPhone, <coughs> the timer on your iPhone and saying, okay, um, you have two minutes to do this and then um, we're gonna get started. That thing, um, and then let's see what I'm trying to remember. Okay, um, this is an example because sometimes an initiation um, process is so hard. So this is something that I actually used with some kids where we create this little circle, and there's specific things that a child can do, think in their head about how I can get started. And we've actually put this on kids' desks at home and at school. So if they're struggling to get started, it's okay, the first thing is okay, I have to focus in. And then I have to think, what am I supposed to do? Look at all the possibilities, focus in. If I don't know what to do, I ask the teacher for, for clarification. Answer the question, participate in the class. Check your answer, job well done. You know, And it seems kind of simple, but sometimes that's hard for kids. So it's giving them sort of those specific tools um, to think about to get going. Um, and then um, helping children handle working memory issues. So as Craig talked about, this is kind of your scratch pad in your brain um, to remember what the teacher just said, what page to turn to. Um, and sometimes when kids have working memory deficits, it's really hard because um, school is fast. Um, so the, the good thing about this is that technology can help so dramatically with working memory issues, especially as kids get older. Um, and I, I've seen kids actually um, take out an iPhone and just take a picture of the board um, with the homework assignment on it so that they can refer back to that later because they, that they know they won't be able to remember it. Um, but it's creating those systems for kids to help with that. Um, oftentimes, 
with working memory, if we can do something where we take a multi-sensory approach, so the, the teacher says the direction, but then it's on the board or the child can have a copy in their hand so they're hearing it and they're seeing it, um, sometimes that works really, really well. But sometimes with working memory issues, they, kids need accommodations. So they need notes um, from the teacher. Um, they might have a homework buddy that they call um, to say, oh gosh, can you help me? I, I know we have to do some math problems, but I'm forgetting which ones. Um, sometimes also having rubrics really, really helps with that as well, if the teacher can provide a rubric. And I've had parents design rubrics or samples as well. So they recognize, okay, my kiddo's just lost here. But there's a great, um, I have the, on, I did a resource list um, that I, I'll hand out to you guys, but there's an awesome app. Um, it's called Tools for Students. Um, and I, think the, I think it's not free, but it's really exceptional because it helps kids brainstorm, especially um, writing assignments, and then helps them, uh, it just gives tons and tons of writing prompts and rubrics, and it's, it's, it's fabulous. Um, so this is an example of a student homework checklist that I've used with kids. Um, so it's creating some sort of system. And I know this talk, what I'm talking about is kind of boring, but I think sometimes just the nitty gritties of, of making something tangible. So this is going to go back and forth from school to home, and I'm going to check it every day to see uh, what this looks like is helpful. So um, the, this student homework checklist it said, um, I started my work prom promptly. I maintained focus on schoolwork. I managed my feelings as well. And then this is my required language arts homework. And then the teacher signs off on it. This is my required math homework. And then something on the bottom saying, um, I turned in my homework the next day. And again, as parents, if you're designing something like this or you're interested in doing something like this, you also have to kind of talk to the teacher and see if they're willing to um, put a system in place like this. And if um, they're willing to help, but this doesn't work with their style, then you have to kind of work with them as well. Because sometimes if we create this great plan, but the teacher isn't going to be able to fill it out, it doesn't do us any good or help with that process. Um, OK. Um, helping children plan and organize. Um, I think one thing to really, really think about um, is that sometimes kids get so overwhelmed, so it's breaking down tasks. Yeah, okay, sorry, I'll, I'll speed up. Um, breaking down tasks for kids. Um, and I'm a, I'm a real big fan of having calendars like on the fridge, so every Sunday you scan the horizon for the week, um, where you look at what your week is going to look like. And you know you have a big project that's due Thursday. So it's helping that child chunk, okay, what are we gonna do Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday? And really laying it out and even writing it on a chart, sometimes it is, is really, really helpful. Um, and this is an example of a checklist, um, a morning checklist for a kiddo. And I've used an app that I think is fabulous. Again, it was originally created for kids with autism, but I use it all the time for, for kids that are not on the spectrum. And it's called <coughs> Choice Works. And there's some super cool things. You can create schedules for kids, checklists. I'm a huge, huge fan of just creating checklists. So this is the morning schedule. I wake up, I eat, I change my clothes, I brush my teeth, I comb my hair, um, I put on my coat, and then I can choose an activity. The cool thing about this app is you can actually take pictures of the child doing it. And then you can either print it out and use it as a checklist, or if you have an iPad, you can actually move it over. Um, and you can also put a timing device in here, so you can help them with that time management. This skill should take two minutes. This, sh this should take five minutes. It's, it's awesome. I mean, I can't say enough about this app. I love it. It's called Choice Works. Choice Works, yeah. Um, and it can see, uh, once you get going with it, it's super easy. Um, and then um, another thing to help with kids kind of thinking about their thinking 
Um, I'll often do a visual <coughs> cue as well. This is a picture actually of my son. Uh, <laughs> and um, when I when I pack up, I ask myself, you know, do I have my phone? Do I have my green folder? What do I need to complete my homework? Um, are all my supplies in my backpack? But creating little visuals like this and getting creative and maybe putting that in the backpack or putting that um, on the bridge and saying, okay, let's go check your, your chart. Things like that to get them thinking. How'd you make that one? That is um, on Comic Life. So that's another fabulous, fab fabulous application for, and super easy to use on your computer. Um, then um, helping children monitor their behavior. Um, oftentimes, in terms of helping kids monitor, if kids are struggling with this, I'll use scales. So on a scale of zero to 10, how do you think you did with this task? And then I ask the teacher to scale that same thing, um, or the parent. And so then, then you say, okay, you think you did a 10, but your teacher said you were a three. Now, let's talk about that to kind of help them think about how they self-monitor themselves. And oftentimes I'll just do something like this. Um, what makes a positive leader? Um, I, um, I stop and think, is it kind, is it true, is it necessary? And then the child um, says, okay, today I think I did so well with this, I think I got a six. And then the teacher fills it out and says, oh. And then they talk about where that disconnection is to kind of have those awesome, um, those good meeting conversations. And then talk about what they're gonna do differently tomorrow. Um, so I just wanted to give you guys some concrete things um, because I think it's, it's really helpful to put a plan like this in place and say, okay, we're gonna test it out for say three weeks and every Thursday we're gonna sit down and talk about how you're doing on your plan. I think kids that um, struggle with this need that check-in, um, and they need those conversations, and they need to know specifically what they're working on. Um, any questions? Yeah. This is sort of a general question, but okay, so your child, when they're young, and I have kids, four boys that, you know, and they're all very different in this, in this way. Yeah. Some of them don't need it at all. So I'm thinking of my 10-year-old that really needs to sort of have his hand held throughout this process. But my question really is, so when you intervene at a fairly young age and kind of try and teach them and set them up to make these decisions themselves, mm -hmm. I mean, ultimately, I, I mean, I, I would hope that I can start backing away and they can do this themselves. So is that, will these kids that have executive function problems now always have that? Or with intervention when they're young, will they finally get over that hump and you don't have to worry about them at all anymore? Yeah. That's a great, great question. Um, and unfortunately, I can't give you a solid answer. Um, what I do know is that oftentimes with these routines and this help, um, we see great improvement. Um, but sometimes I think it's good to think about if, if I put this in place and my child is just bombing, then perhaps my expectations are too high and I have to readjust my goal here. Um, so sometimes, especially if there are other kids around, that's hard to do because you have different expectations for the different kids. But sometimes that's a cue that, okay, I need to readjust what I can expect from him um, and shift my mindset because what you want is for him to feel some success so he's motivated to keep working at developing these skills. Okay, yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, Thank you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> if you need to stand up for a minute if you're one of those fidgety ones and just don't go anywhere, uh, but let me get my slide show up and we'll... Do you need a cheese stick? Yeah. Are we going to need a cheese stick? No. No. Cheese stick? Yeah. 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 Oh, I see. This goes in at 10 30. I'm going to go ahead and start. So, if you could have a seat, that'd be great. And hopefully, we'll have a little bit of time for QA. Uh, 
Middle School. My name is Mike Shields. I'm a learning specialist at uh, St. Anne's. It's our first year here. As Craig alluded to, I was in administration uh, for many years, so I've seen uh, executive functions and children's behavior from a lot of different angles. Um, but a little bit of a disclaimer. First of all, I speak with a Southern accent, uh, and I do that because I spent 32 years in Atlanta, was born and raised in Kentucky before I moved out to Colorado. So if you need a translator, uh, then there might be some other Southern area here that can give you a little bit of translation game. Uh, secondly, I speak from a, different, a few different perspectives. Uh, and that is, uh, I was um, approximately 20 years as a learning specialist before I uh, went into administration. I have, in, for 40 years, worked with middle school kids, and which is, and I'm going to talk a lot about middle school and how that complicates executive function, and maybe take it back a little bit on what you said. Uh, secondly, I have a child who is diagnosed uh, with executive function and ADHD. He is 26 years old, and I actually rubbed into the brain develops at 25 or 26, which is good news for me uh, because the answer to your question doesn't go away, and the answer to that is no. Uh, you learn to cope with it, you learn to deal with it, uh, because my third perspective is if I was at this school or in any school right now, I would be diagnosed with executive function. And uh, I can go through the list. You know, I, I was writing little things, uh, the list, attention. Uh, the, you know, the little family circle thing where the kid goes from point A to point B, that's me uh, in my mind. Uh, organization, this has been a tough year for me from the standpoint of I'm a floater. Uh, and when I was in administration, I had one room and that's where all my stuff is. And I'm carrying stuff around here, uh, which taps my skills to stay organized. I carried a box around for a long time with all my stuff in it, and I carried two boxes around uh, with all my stuff in it because I teach in four different rooms, etc. So the organization, still there. Uh, impulse control, uh, sorry Craig, I'm the guy who's, who's tapping the horn. I live in Atlanta, like I said, uh, in Atlanta traffic, you learn how to drive, and you learn how to drive aggressively, and I was the guy when somebody cut me off or something like that with the horn movement control, thank goodness I could stand up right now because about an hour of sitting and I was ready to do this. Um, time management, great story. Uh, the first year I taught, I taught in a modular classroom, which is a fancy name for a trailer. And uh, so I talked to my wife, bless her heart. Uh, I talked to my wife, I said, oh man, this is ugly. We need to go out and paint it. Great. I said, how long will it take? He said, it'll probably take a couple of hours. All right, six and a half hours into this, we were still painting the trailer. Uh, she did stay with me, that's a good thing. But my ability to manage time and predict how long it's gonna take, uh, I still have trouble with that. Working memory, prime example. Um, we go to Costco all the time, and uh, my wife, bless her heart, uh, she'll say, did you remember your wallet? And being a typical adolescent, uh, which I'm still stuck in that a little bit because I work with middle school kids, uh, I would say, you know, yes, I do, leave me alone. So she stopped asking me that. So I drove all the way to Costco. Went in, you can't get in Costco unless you got your little Costco card. All right, so there I am. And I drove all the way home and got my Costco card and drove all the way back to Costco. So that's, um, yes, I have executive function. Uh, it's a part of me, uh, and I'll end this. Um, or I'll say one thing right now. One of the key things is to help your child. One of the one of the mistakes I made is I tried to fix my child, and there's a difference with that. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Uh, what I would like to do uh, is I'd like to talk about a couple of things. Uh, two things. What's different during the middle school years and what parents can do to help in the middle school with the child's executive function? Uh, what's different in the middle school years uh, in a child's life? A tremendous amount of growth in several areas. And research will show that socially, emotionally, physically, and intellectually, they will be two years above or two years below grade level. And again, that all catches up around 10th grade or something like that. Now, what you run into uh, in my years of uh, working in middle school, there was one time where I had two, I, I vividly remember them, two boys, they both played Division I football. They were huge in eighth grade. Uh, you know, 140, 150 pounds. Emotionally, they were like fifth graders. And so they would wrestle around the hallway and all that kind of stuff, and they threw a lot of weight around. But it, it goes, it just really goes to show, same way you'll have a, a child that looks like he's a fifth or a sixth grader, or she looks like a fifth or sixth grader, yet intellectually, in mathematics, and some of those types of things, 
they're way out there on 9th, 10th, 11th grade and thinking very abstractly, etc. So it is an interesting time and this complicates the whole executive function issue because they're dealing with adolescence and all this brain development and all these types of things in addition to what you've seen in an elementary school. Uh, what's different in school? Changing classes. All right, and when you talk about having someone as an ally, all of a sudden they're going to five or six or seven different uh, classes. Uh, the curriculum is for the most part departmentalized, and what that means is that uh, each teacher is teaching a particular subject, and there is some interrelation uh, to them. But the curriculum, by the curriculum being departmentalized, they have different teachers, and usually that equates out to an increased homework load. Um, and a school like St. Anne's is great at saying uh, this is this is what we're trying to do with homework load uh, and they have a, uh, a little study time during the day when they get some of their homework done etc but ultimately they're going in different directions and they're supposed to come back to their locker and reorganize themselves before they go to the next class all right and for those of you that haven't been in middle school yet uh, it's an interesting time, especially a child when they've got the executive function with time management and with organization in order to navigate that day. And then throw in there's a changing friend structure. Uh, and from a standpoint, your best friend in fourth or fifth grade might not be your best friend as you begin to go, uh, go through middle school. So that's a complication. And then the last one, just distractions, distractions, and distractions. And there's a ton of those in middle school. And it could be where the girls and guys awake and they, they think about the dating thing and they think about who's going to like whom and, and all of those types of things. Usually you begin sports uh, at that time with the school sports and you've got outside sports. I've had students in middle school that will be on three different sports teams at one time. And they're finishing up two soccer teams. There's the school soccer team, the club soccer team, and then they're starting basketball on club and soon they're going to start basketball. Uh, uh, at the school and so they're very 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 scheduled now think about what Craig talked about think about what Kathy talked about and then throw all those things in there with a child who has the types of and issues is a strong word but has the, the, the makeup like I did and had the makeup of um, going through that and it gets complicated uh, the other thing is what's different at home the quest for independence what I have found with middle school kids, they want to do it on their own. And to sit down with them, some students will let you do that, uh, but as they progress through the middle school, uh, for the most part, they want to do it on their own. Going back to homework, do you need help? No. Okay, do you need uh, me to look over your work like you used to do last year? No thanks, I've got it, Mom, I've got it. Uh, or Dad, there's a couple of dads in here. Uh, reduced communication. Uh, what happened to school today? Nothing. Uh, you know, that type of thing. They're not going to come home and pour out their heart and soul, nor do you really want them to do that. All right, but there's a limited or communication reduced. And so all of a sudden you don't know quite what's going on because they're not sharing that much with you. Uh, need for increased sleep. Uh, Craig talked a little bit about that. And they do need to sleep. And then a lot of times if they get into the process of, gee, I play video games and now I've got homework and they're going to bed late and all that. And then you get in this cycle or spiral where they're not getting enough sleep. Therefore, they're not functioning at a higher level. Therefore, the next day of school is a little bit more complicated uh, for them, et cetera. So the uh, needs for increased sleep, eating habits change. Um, I had a student the other day, I was watching eating, I thought, gosh, I mean, the old, the old cliche, uh, does they have a hollow leg, uh, especially boys and girls as they're going through growth spurts, so there's different eating habits. There's all the drama of middle school, uh, and that is who likes whom, who sat with whom uh, at lunch, and uh, so-and-so likes so-and-so. And somebody once told me it's the only time in a, a person's life where you can decide who can you can decide to go with somebody, go with somebody, and break up with somebody, and never have a conversation with that person because it's, it's all done by third party. Right? And so, and a lot of times, if you're the third person navigating that, all right, then what happens is you're all caught up in this trauma, and it's taken a phenomenal amount of your time, and you're not even involved with it. Uh, and then distractions, distractions, and distractions. Um, School issues in the middle school, poor organization escalates. 
uh, and it really does because of, uh, um, you know, having to change classes and, and those types of things. And I have to say, uh, working memory is taxed, uh, and that is, um, you know, they're having to, to go and remember what this teacher said and what this teacher said. Uh, and, and you talk about here's three things you need to do, uh, and if your child's like I am, uh, my wife will ask me to do a, a two or three things, and one of them will get done, and then I do get distracted with the piece of paper and origami uh, and all of that. And that escalates just because of adolescence in middle school, but also it is taxed. Attitude changes, and I think this is one of the most important things that happen in middle school. Your child will either have a lot of grit, and I love the word grit, uh, we read a, uh, a faculty reading coming into the school year, and it's why, why children are successful. It talks about grit. Uh, and basically, it's their willingness to put forth an effort and their willingness to work hard. And so it either is grit or it's lackadaisical. Uh, they can be the same child on the same day, uh, but they can, be, they can be laid back, well, I don't want to do that. Uh, I had a little girl tell me yesterday, uh, we were doing some stuff on timetables. Well, I don't want to do that anymore. You don't want to do that anymore. And uh, she just basically did this. I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm having trouble with seven times eight, and I'm not going to do it anymore. Um, and then increased anxiety because a child who is basically anxious, uh, that increases because they're having to navigate so many different parts of the day that that anxiety level can go up. And then what this teacher is demanding, what this teacher is demanding, how this teacher tests, and those types of things, it gets very interwoven. All right, and their anxiety level can go up, which is counterproductive many times to children and, and uh, with executive function, and many times children with executive function will, uh, in those middle school years, have uh, anxiety. Uh, the, la the next last one, effort fluctuates. Uh, and sometimes you can see a lot of effort, sometimes you can't. I've got two little seventh grade boys that I keep an eye on, uh, and they're either going up or they're going down, and there's not a whole lot in the middle. They're either working hard, and the grades are coming and they're focused, et cetera, or they're on a downslide and you're wondering, uh, you know, what's going on with them. So, so that, uh, the effort can fluctuate. And then the last thing, the reality of the situation sets in. And I think that's one of the things that you need to be cognizant of as a parent, and that is a child will realize in middle school, this is harder for me. I'm working really hard and this person's getting better grades than I am with a lot less effort and that in they they understand that. And one of a few things will happen, and I've seen it across the board, either to develop that grit or they'll become the class the class clown or they will um, they will back off and therefore I'm not gonna work hard because if I try to work hard and it's still really hard then that just tells everybody that I'm dumb, or I'm stupid, or I'm this, or I'm that. And you've got to be cognizant of that um, as parents. But the reality sets in that they understand more about who they are, and what they're learning, and how easy it comes to them, or how easy it comes to their really good friends. And I've seen children react to that all different ways in those three different areas. What can parents do? Uh, this is my feeling and a whole mixture of, of different things. Inspiration is job number one. Uh, that's our job is to try to inspire our children. And from that standpoint, sometimes I think our children look at us as perfect. Uh, Mom and dad are perfect. And I think from an inspiration, one of the things, uh, and again, I can look back and say, gosh, I wish I'd have done all this differently with my son Patrick. But one of the things I wish I had shared more with him, I've done more as he's become an adult, is to let him know what my struggles were. Because as, as you go through it, typically um, if a, your child has executive function, there's somebody in your family that has some type of similar type of profile and who is very successful. I consider myself to be a relatively successful person. Uh, even though I get lost and I go to Walmart and I can't remember where I park my car and I've got to do little things that still help me do that, you know, kids need to know that you struggle with certain things too. Uh, secondly, be your child's advocate. Uh, and you can do that by finding an ally at school, whether it be a Craig or a Kathy or a Mike Shields if you're at St. Anne's or there are all sort of learning specialists and those types of things. But found, find an ally at school because what you want to do 
uh, is to, and I'll talk about that in just a minute, but what you want to do is you want them to develop those skills where they can do them on their own. And some of it is coping with the particular type of learning style that they have. Uh, limit outside activities. Uh, one of the things we did with Patrick, at one point he was taking um, religious ed classes and he was in karate and he was in this and he was in that and he was in that and finally we just looked at each other and said we can't do that and a lot of kids get very involved they want to take the dance lessons and they want to be involved with the club sport and they gee it's in middle school and they want to try out for the sports team and all of a sudden they're so over scheduled now what you don't want is to not have your child have a life outside of school either where they're coming home and doing all this homework and worrying and all that kind of stuff. But you do want to look at what's realistic and try to limit it. Value success and failure. Uh, and that's perfect in the middle school. Because if you're going to mess up, a great time to mess up is in the middle school. And if you're going to learn particular skills, or you're going to learn how to fail a test, or how to analyze the test after you've taken the test in order not to fail a similar test for the same reason, that's great to do in the middle school. So value success, but also value the failures or the pitfalls or the lessons. Because some of the best lessons I ever learned were learned through messing up or having a failure or, or such. Uh, allow your child to suffer logical consequences, and I think that's one of the hardest things for us to do as parents. Uh, but sometimes they'll make a decision because they're Mr. or Miss Independent, and they want to do it their way, and it doesn't work. Uh, and then there's ways to approach that, but a child needs to uh, suffer those consequences. You can't run interference with them uh, for the rest of their life. And the one thing I did do that I wish I had done, don't feel sorry for your child. And uh, Patrick had, um, he had his executive function issues, so he was very bright, but his spilled all over into the social realm. And he didn't read social cues well. Uh, an example of that was uh, in elementary school, he loved to play sports and he was ultra competitive. And he would go out and they'd play kickball at lunch and he'd go play kickball and all that kind of, but he would argue a call at first base <laughs> until everybody walked off the field. Now think about that. And that's so sad for me to think of, about that. And I, we really at times felt sorry because we saw exhibits of that along the way. Don't feel sorry for your child, all right? Look at them, somebody once told me, um, um, parent to their potential to their potential. Look at who your child can be, not necessarily a straight-A student or this or that, but look who they can be and parent them to that. Don't feel sorry for your child. Uh, the other thing is take hold and let go. Kathy talked a little bit about that. Uh, sometimes uh, you've, got to, uh, you've got to lead, especially in those sixth grade uh, years, but you've also got to, uh, to let go. Now, the noted um, uh, educational psychologist, Irma Bombeck, uh, I put a, uh, a poem in there that she wrote, and it was about raising children like flying a kite. Read it, because ultimately what you want, it, want them to do is you keep letting out the string, you, you shore them up, you get them out of the trees, all that kind of stuff, but you kept letting out the string with the knowledge that eventually the string will break and they will fly on their own. And that's your goal. Your goal is to help your child develop the skill. So read the Irma poem, put it up in your refrigerator, uh, and realize that that's important. For example, what I will say, an incoming sixth grader and the support that you give has to be very different than an exiting eighth grader. And you have to be very conscious of that. Because if you're doing the same amount of help and support you are with your child at the end of eighth grade that you were at the beginning of sixth, then your child's gonna have problems when they get to high school. Um, where am I? Help them develop the skills they need. Uh, help with organization. One of the greatest things I ever did, and I learned this from a seventh grader here at St. Anne's, uh, and he kept carrying this folder around. I said, I said, and I'll use his name, I said, Charlie, why are you carrying the folder around? He said, I've got everything in it. And I said, well, show me. And he said, he's got, uh, he's got his planner. Uh, he's got his planner. Uh, inside of it is the schedule. He's got a thing for each class. He's got extra paper in the back, and he's got a pencil pouch. This is his homework folder. All right, this goes to every class. You know how teachers will say, those that have middle school students, uh, the, the teachers will say everybody's got a notebook and all that kind of stuff. This is the homework folder for this young man. And, uh, and I've since had uh, developed it with two or three other kids that have executive function 
uh, problems, I said, look, if somebody breaks into their house, somebody breaks in your house and they're stealing stuff, tell them not to steal the food. <laughs> okay? Because this gets them there, all right? But it's also, it's only for homework, and it's got to be cleared out. So any homework that's assigned or any homework that's brought back, it's here, all right? And it's an organization. Uh, and again, not only can we learn from each other, we can learn from the kids of their coping uh, uh, mechanism. Develop any evening and morning routines. Kathy talked about that. Uh, put everything that's got to come to school, including the folder. Oh, by the way, I bought that at Office Max. Went to Office Depot, uh, Target, all different places. I love this because it has a big first uh, pocket in it. So I bought all of them at this one Office Max. I, and are uh, helping kids utilize those in school. School. What happened? Uh, develop the evening and morning routines. Children need routines, and they need to have everything set out so they can just grab it to go to school so they're not looking all around. And again, the issue with that is some of you in this room, if your child's got executive function, you may have the same type of thing. Uh, I used to open car doors at a, uh, my old school, and you could tell who had executive function by the world the way the car looked when you opened the car door. Some were very nice and neat, and some you were wondering what was gonna fall out of the car uh, at that time. And so uh, develop those routines, create a productive at-home workspace. There's also a handout in there about help your child organize an area to study, and there are things to, uh, to put in there, et cetera. It needs to be free from distractions. You need to have a study time. And what I recommend for middle schoolers are to do it in blocks and where you can give your child some independence on that. Uh, at sixth grade, they probably need to block out uh, anywhere from an hour to an hour and a half uh, for homework, and they need to do it every night. And if they say, oh, I don't have homework, that's fine, you've got your block, read ahead, do a free reading, do all those kind of things that are coming down the pipe. Work for 25 minutes, take five minutes off. Work for 25 minutes, take five minutes off. You can say to your child, um, okay, we're gonna block out 90 minutes. When do you wanna do it? You know, and give them a little bit of control as far as deciding when, but you're deciding, yes, you need to do this and you need to set aside that time. Um, move from let's try this, that goes back to this, uh, the kite flying, let's try this to what's your plan? And an eighth grader, uh, or as they get older, they have to develop their own plan. And you can sit there and develop the plan for them and help them with that. But by the by, their eighth grade year, especially the end of their eighth grade year, that you need to be able to say to them, look, uh, I, I lie awake at night worrying about you. And uh, I, just help me out here. I need to know what your plan is so that I can sleep uh, at night. So tell me your plan. I'm not gonna, if I'm part of your plan, that's great. But I've got to know what the plan is. Uh, so that I'm, I feel comfortable with it. And then uh, the final part, be aware of the working memory. Kathy and, and Craig both talked about this, and be aware of it, because you can cognizantly say, I'm gonna ask my child to do two things, or three things, or four things, and be cognizant <coughs> of it, and stretch them a little bit. Uh, and when you, you've got an adolescent child, I'm gonna tell you three <coughs> things to do, this, repeat them back to me, now let's see if you can do them and then maybe it stretches to four, maybe it stretches to five, and maybe they take a note, or like I do, and put stickies, if you come to my office, got stickies everywhere. You can even get an app that puts stickies on your computer, if I found out. And, but I've got stickies everywhere that help me how to remember to do things. The final thing I left you, and it's in your packet, it's a Chinese proverb, and I'll go back to one of the things that I started with, and that is I spent years trying to fix my child and uh, that wasn't necessarily the thing that I should have done, and I'm speaking as a parent now. Uh, I tried to give them the tools. We did have an ally at the school. We came to a small nurturing school. People that knew Patrick kept an eye on those types of things. But one of the things in the, the Chinese proverb, if you'll take the time uh, to do that, it's about a, a gentleman who carried two pots, and one leaked and had a little bit of a crack in it. And uh, the, the pot felt really bad about that. Uh, and it comes to find out that that's the side that the, uh, the person who carried when they did the water, he planted the flowers on and he, um, and the flowers grew because some of the water leaked out each day. And one of the, <coughs> one of the mottos that I've tried to uh, live by is value your child for who they are, not for who you want them to be. Most people in this room 
um, have some sort of type A-ness about them uh, and they're achievers of those types of things. And that doesn't mean, again, go back to who they can be, but value children who for they are, look at who they can be, help them get there, but have, have those high expectations, help them organize, find the ally, and work through um, the early adolescence uh, that you'll find in middle school and give them the skills so that they'll fly on their own when they get to high school because there's no way you can keep up with everything that they've got going on in high school. And middle school is that trial period where they're trying some things out and they're gonna have to fall uh, a few times, but keep those expectations high, help them pick themselves up and help, help them develop their own plan. That's my middle school. Just a couple of closing thoughts to tell you how much extra energy Mike has and how committed he is to the kids. Last week I was walking down the eighth grade hallway and I saw one of the kids' lockers. They had this delightful storage rack system. It was all organized. I'm like, wow, where'd you get that? I'm thinking, you know, on this back. And the kid said, Mr. Shields made it for me. Oh, wow, that's really cool. And I looked at the next locker, and the next locker, he made them for everybody. I'm like, holy moly, he's got a lot of free time. He can't sit still. <laughs> he can't sit still. Um, real quick, just a couple of thoughts. I had some help with that. Oh, help. good. Uh, listening to both of them talk, and took a couple quick notes. First of all, when you pick your kids up, the first words out of your mouth should not be, how much homework do you have? It should be, hi, honey, I love you. you tell them about your day first. Now, before you leave your camps, for some of your kids, make sure you ask them, and they open up their side of the plan, Make sure they have it in the notebook. Because if you leave campus and you get home 45 minutes later and the kid doesn't have it, how do you feel? He's not really happy, right? So we don't leave until you make sure they have it. Uh, we've talked a lot about consistency. Well, first of all, slow down. Slow your family stuff. All this stuff takes time. You've got to slow down. We talked about consistency. The number I tell you is shoot for is 80%. If you have to be consistent 80% of the time, you're a fabulous parent. Now, when you read this in Parents Magazine, it sounds like you're supposed to be consistent 100% of the time. You can't be, it's not possible. If you're consistent 40% of the time, you really need to get on it, right? So it's really consistent, structured, routines, keep that going. Uh, pick one thing to start with. You're not going to do all this overnight, but just pick one thing and get the kid to get going. On the homework thing, I like the idea of your, your child's administrative assistant. I'll tell you, the kid's like, hey, your mom's going to be your administrative assistant. You don't have to pay for it now. When you're my age, you don't have to pay for it. Right now you don't. You spend five or ten minutes organizing at the start. You, you help them look at what their homework is. You estimate how long each one will take, what they want to start first with, second, put it all in order. Okay? Set the timer. Depending on the age of the child, let's say ten minutes. Set ten, ten minutes. You leave or go work in the kitchen if they're in the kitchen working. The time comes off, you come back and see how they're doing. If they have questions during the work period, you tell them just circle the problem and move on. Because what a lot of the kids will do. Mom, I don't get this one. You come back over. You just spent 10 minutes up on that Two minutes later, what happens? Well, I don't get this one either. Right? And you're constantly going back and forth. Is going back and forth a big time waster? It's horribly inefficient. So you just say, circle it. I'll check what you've done uh, at the middle. At the end, you could have two periods in there, a little exercise break. At the end, you're just going to sit down with them. You're going to go over everything. You're going to stack it up. You're going to put it in the notebook to take back to school. And you're going to put it in the backpack and have the backpack ready to go now. Homework's not done until everything's in the backpack and the backpack's about to go or wherever you keep it. So it's a very structured, simple system. I think we can, I can hang for a little bit. Um, oh, and off your thing, parent for independence. He said embrace your middle schoolers, child for independence. My favorite parenting moments was when my son was in sixth grade. I was reading the, the paper in the morning, drinking my coffee. He said, hey, honey, you got to, it was in the evening. And I said, you got to get your chores done. And out of this room came, Stop telling me what to do! Now the German father part of me just about jumped out of that chair to march back there, but I didn't. I bit my tongue and I said, excuse me? And he said, I want to be able to do my chores on my own. And I was like, whoa! That's what you want! That's what you're parenting for. You're parenting for independence. Right? And we came up with a system. I said, okay, every nine years you chore, you got your list. They got to be done by 8 o'clock. You can do whatever you want. They're not done at 8 o'clock. I get the right to come and get you and turn off the TV or whatever it is. At that point, I get to get interfered at 8 o'clock. And he's like, cool, it worked great. You're preparing for independence. You're pushing that independence as much as you can. 
Thanks very much. We can hang out at the annual table next spring. We'll do two talks a year. We're hoping to have um, uh, Kristen Race, who's the former psychologist at Colorado Academy. She's out to see books. She just published a book on uh, mindfulness and parenting. Not being a mindful, mindful base. The yoga stuff. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Relax and calm. And reducing anxiety and stress. And we're hoping that we'll have her as our, our one presenter in the spring. Thanks for coming. We can hang out with you.